Energy and Republican Institute, which is a liberal think tank based in Budapest, Hungary. So on behalf of Republican Institute, I would like to welcome everyone uh, to this event and thank you all for coming uh, to this event called Tyranny and Hope, uh, the State of Central Europe in the European Union. Today, uh, based on the country report on Hungary elaborated by the Hungarian Europe Society, uh, we are going to talk about the future of Central European countries in the European Union. Uh, we are going to discuss the, the, the right-wing populist wave that uh, now we're seeing in these countries and also discuss uh, what EU institutions, member states, politicians, parties could and should do uh, to uh, answer these challenges uh, in the European Union. Uh, today, uh, we're going to start uh, with an opening opening speech uh, by the chairman of the Hungarian Europe Society, Istvan Hegedis. Then we're going to have a roundtable discussion with MEPs and experts. And then uh, Thomas Ilka, the regional director of European Dialogue here at Internet Brussels, will give uh, closing remarks. Uh, so, uh, last but not least, I would like to thank the Hungarian Europe Society for co-organizing this event with Republican and also the Friedrich Ramon Foundation for Freedom uh, for hosting uh, this event. So without uh, further ado, I would like to thank again everyone for coming and I will pass the floor to each one. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea, and thank you for all of you for coming. And thank you certainly to the Friedrich Naumann Foundation, Friedrich Naumann Stiftung, uh, for hosting this uh, event. And uh, I would also like to thank you all the participants at our panel, but it will be our moderator, Eric Kuskiewicz, who will introduce the participants of the panel discussion. What I am going to do now is uh, somehow a sort of uh, introduction which is uh, based on our study on our report on Hungary which was written actually before the October 13th uh, local elections uh, in Hungary the title of our report is uh, tyranny and hope and I'm sort of proud that we put into the title the the, the notion of hope because certainly before the election, the situation looked much more gloomier than after the local elections, but I think we wanted to emphasize that no such regimes like the Orban regime would uh, survive forever. The only problem is certainly that we don't know when it would collapse, how it would collapse, and how the transition to a more democratic, uh, liberal democratic system will look like and how can we achieve uh, this goal. So as you see, it's, uh, I don't want to pretend to be somehow totally neutral. Certainly uh, the Hungarian Europe Society has so many NGOs and think tanks in Hungary. Are, we oppose and we all opposing the current regime, which uh, as you all know here in the room, it's a liberal foundation where we are now is certainly oppressing uh, uh, liberal liberties, uh, freedom of speech, uh, constitutional rights, human rights in Hungary. So I'm not going to talk about these issues uh, in, in, in a lot of details because I think all of you who are here uh, know a lot about uh, the events since 2010, what have happened uh, in Hungary and uh, in the broader sense. But I want to talk first about hope because that's I think very important to start with and then I will talk a little bit about tyranny. So why, why we can emphasize hope uh, even more after the local elections? I think most of you know the results which already was also one and a half months before that uh, in many cities, especially in Budapest, the opposition was able to win the uh, elections and I think it's very important what happened because there was a debate before the elections whether it has any sense to participate in such elections because the regime 
has certainly manipulated the race and whether it has any sense because it's very likely that the ruling party would win anyway. Now this debate has shifted a little bit because at least we have some evidence that the opposition, a united, sort of united opposition, has a chance to win. And what was the headlines in the Hungarian media, especially in the free part, the remaining free part of the Hungarian media, that was exactly the same, Orban is beatable. I think that was the number one message what came out from the election. Now I want to go a little bit further on, on this logic. So Orban is beatable, and what happened to the opposition is maybe even more important. Those uh, politicians who seem to be sort of losers in the opposition, whatever parties they come from, from old socialists or new Momentum uh, politicians. You remember Momentum is a very new group but was not able to reach the 5% threshold, threshold at, the gen, at the parliamentary elections just a year ago. Now it's around 6, 8, 10% and has many uh, mayors in, in Hungary, like the other opposition parties. So these politicians finally can say that there are people, voters, behind us. It creates a very different psychological environment. First of all, many more voters might feel that now it has sense to vote for those politicians whom others voted for, and they might not only think about it, if I vote for a loser, it has no sense uh, since uh, I want to get whatever rewards for my vote, now it might change in the eyes of the voters. But it might also change, uh, it can also change the situation of the politicians themselves who look at themselves like winners. I have support from the electorate. And I think both of that, that the voters and the politicians themselves might behave my more, much more confidently, might change the political outcome sooner or later. So that's um, maybe a more psychological argumentation, but I think it's very important in politics when we never know how the mood of the electorate changes and why it is changing. So I think there is a new uh, situation. Uh, what I would like to add, that was the psychological part, but to be a little bit more traditionally scientific, I think what is important to mention that the whole party system has changed. Just one or two years ago, there was a debate whether the opposition party which very often proclaim their identity, uh, their identities in contrast to each other within the opposition, now finally uh, accepted that at least in such cases when we have only one candidate, like in individual constituencies or like at local elections when we will vote for mayors, for example, when we have one candidate against another candidate who is a biggest candidate, the opposition should be united in case, let's say, a Fidesz guy would get around 40, 45%, the only chance to win when the opposition gets united. It was not easy. For many political parties in Hungary, their own identity, their story, how they have developed, their genesis is certainly very important. Now they had to realize or had to accept whatever compromise it means, that if we really want to get rid of the Orban regime sooner or later, the opposition should cooperate, especially in the case of individual constituencies. And that, uh, that sort of development, certainly the pressure of the Orban regime helped a lot, uh, means that Jobbik, the former far-right party, is also included into that new uh, uh, united front of, uh, of the opposition. And the debates which were so important one or two years ago, whether an extreme right-wing party can become a part of that unity seems to be uh, at the moment over. Now, it seems to be that everybody accepted, maybe had to take a, a big break before accepting it, that Jobbik is part of that sort of united uh, opposition. 
Uh, and it also happened because certainly the very right wing, the even more extreme right wing, wing of the of your big was kicked out from the party, so the real Nazis are not anymore in inside the party. But it's not an easy psychological process at all, and it doesn't mean that united opposition means that in all circumstances, in all at all elections, opposition parties should unite always. But it means that in crucial situation, this is now a real threat to Orbán's regime, what, uh, what the opposition can uh, uh, give, can uh, offer to the, to the workers. So what happened with the party system, that Orbán proclaimed many years ago that Fidesz is in the very center of the political spectrum. Your big is on the extreme right, having 15, 20% of the votes, and then all the other parties, another 20%, but Fidesz is in the middle, and there is no chance that anybody can uh, win against Fidesz. Now it has changed. We get back closer to a traditional two-party block system, at least in, at the moment. And the question is always in Hungarian politics, do you vote for Orban or do you vote against Orban? It's, so, it's getting so simple. And uh, I think that's the new situation what Fidesz has to uh, cope with. And certainly the hope, again, is that even mathematically today is so close that the opposition has a chance to win. So I think all these show that we can uh, really have some hopes, although we know that there are a lot of things which contradict to, uh, to such uh, very optimistic uh, uh, speeches. Now let's talk a little bit about uh, tyranny. Uh, let me use our own study because I would like to quote some sentences what we, we published in, in our report. But first of all, maybe I would, I would raise the question without answering it and we will have a round table discussion about it, uh, that the systemic change, what happened what has happened since 2010 led to a very different new regime. But we have problems how to call it, how to call the Orban regime. And we, in our study, tried not to answer this question. So I will not answer this question, but only mentioning some, some possible uh, answers. Is the regime illiberal? Yes, it is, that we can agree. But is it still democratic? That's a big issue, what we always discuss at different con uh, conferences. Is it, if it's not democratic at all, do we have anything like illiberal democracy? Most uh, uh, political scientists would argue that there is nothing like an illiberal democracy. But some others would uh, argue there is something what is called the majoritarian concept of democracy. So. In, in our times, in modern ages, we are not talking about Greece in the, in the uh, ancient times. Do, can we have democracy without liberalism? This is still an issue in political science and I would like to join those who argue that certainly democracy cannot be illiberal or anti-liberal. But should we make then a difference between, let's say, hard populists like Orban and some others who destroy liberal democracy, and maybe those political parties, populist parties, which might have very similar ideas in some policy areas, but might not want to undermine the liberal democracy. So is it an international populist movement all around Europe where Orban is the sort of leader? We might discuss it at the round table uh, debate. Well, what we know, that the Hungarian regime, which uh, has been under construction now for years, does not have a very confident, clear, theoretical or philosophical doctrine or framework. But we have a very clear uh, uh, view that their supporters and voters have enough ideological ground to know whom to vote for and whom to vote against. It's very evident who are the opponents and enemies of uh, these new populists and illiberal 
politicians. Even if we have never read any uh, philosophical argumentation of the, the, the foundation of the Orban regime, we have read a lot of speeches and talks to, to realize who are the enemies of the Orban regime. We are the enemies, we, we, we should admit that. Uh, also, from the aspect of history, we might say that the authoritarian features of the regime are very clear, but we cannot speak about an open dictatorship. Just yesterday we had a huge demonstration which might not have happened in Putin's uh, Russia or not that way, not so uh, peaceful way, but we cannot speak about a liberal democracy anyway, as I tried to argue. In many aspects, the Orban regime resembles us to the period of the interwar, to the interwar period, especially regarding its rhetorics, its cultural references, its uh, historic memories, its, uh, its, its politics of memory and cultural policies in general. But it also reminds us sometimes to the 50s, what sort of rhetoric the communists used in the darkest period of our uh, history. But what I think that at the end, this is a very 21st century phenomenon, the Orban regime and what we have to face. It uses both the, the, the methods and elements of two historic periods, but it's a different one. And again, this hybrid regime, this 21st century hybrid regime, uh, which doesn't imprison its enemies, at least at the moment, we will see, but nothing like ha has happened until now, but uh, rather lets its opponents go to exile or leave the country, that's another different type of political regime. Now, what I want to say very shortly, because time is running, I guess, uh, that what we did in our study was not a traditional analysis of different policy areas. Because I think that when we have an illiberal regime and the whole system is changing, you cannot simply say like in normal times that now this government makes you know, an economic policy where the policy of the interest rates or whatever the poli policy of the national bank is problematic without mentioning the big changes in the institutional setup and in the political system as a whole. So I think what we argued is correct that in acute historical times, a policy-based evaluation of the performances of the government is not enough. The Hungarian situation is evidently much worse than that. And the anti-liberal ethos of the political rulers and the ongoing centralization actually penetrate into all policy areas. So we can find the impact of illiberal dogmas and uh, political decisions in every field of the policy area. So we have to, what we did, we concentrated on such phenomena. And yesterday, if you followed the, the demonstration in the very heart of, in the very downtown of Budapest, this shows a new phase of this uh, conflicting situation, and Orban declared it already a year ago, and we have to listen to him because he very often says what he thinks, Some, very often it's just the other way around, that first we had the political regime, then the economy, and now it's about culture, education, and science. Now what we see when they centralize the performing arts, and they want to control the theaters, they, they want to control the actors. That's the third phase of the regime, how it strengthened its uh, pressure on different areas of everyday political life, including uh, the very culture. Uh, in this uh, uh, top-controlled world, whether we talk about the economy, culture, or, or any other areas, even education, Healthcare. Political trust tends to override capabilities, performance, market excellence. Just talking about the economy, in many sectors, construction, uh, IT, saving corporations, gambling, central public relations services, public advertisements, 
the tenders are so one-sided that always the same loyal entrepreneurs, oligarchs, win the contracts, most, most of which are certainly implemented from taxpayers' money or from EU money, as you probably know. But we can mention many other areas. Just let me mention the education system and healthcare. Since Fidesz came to power, both policies have become severely ideological and burdened with taboos and dogmas. We can talk about the consequences of this illiberal regime. Uh, let me mention maybe only one. Uh, uh, the tertiary education is Hungary is moving away from the object objectives of the European Union as a whole. Hungary uh, currently has 33.7% of uh, students in tertiary education, very far away from the 40% target of the EU. Or let's say education, uh, healthcare. The government has set up an unprecedented centralized healthcare system. And the consequences the withdrawal of resources can be measured in human lives. I might quote, but I will not, many other areas what we uh, actually uh, coped with in our, in our study. But what I want to say as a conclusion, because we are a little bit late, that uh, the regime certainly needs new and new enemies. So it creates it, these enemies from very different strata of the society, especially uh, creates these intellectuals from different people from the intelligentsia and the professional people. And as this expansion of creating enemies is growing, resistance becomes also wider. Yesterday we had such speakers, mostly director of theaters and actors who before did not go to demonstrations and did not speak. And what I feel that if you have very popular actors speaking at demonstrations, well known all over in the countryside, this might have an, an, an impact, a sort of mobilizing effect, maybe on such people having a sort of aha revelation, something is wrong. Now this very popular actor is saying it, not only those economists and political scientists and some opposition people, this aha feeling might maybe uh, reach the deeper segments of our society. So let's keep our hope. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> now I would like to ask Eric and all the panelists, I will be one of them, and let's take our seats. I'm the Vice Chair of the Hungarian Europe Society, and I will be the moderator of this panel. Um, just uh, reflect to Istvan's speech. Anti-liberalism, populism, nativism, whatever categories we use for the political attacks against the constitutional system of liberal democracy, human rights, and the shared values and principles of the European Union means a real threat. In countries like Hungary and Poland, where anti-democratic measurements are vital everyday phenomena, civil groups, academic researchers, opposition parties, politicians, and even citizens with critical thinking live in a shrinking space of individual and community liberties. Although after the European parliamentary elections, uh, we can see that pro-European democratic forces could mobilize their capacities. The current problems are not solved for long term. So what's next? This is the question what we will discuss with our panelists. Let me introduce them and thank you for having us. Uh, first, Katarzyna Morton, uh, who is an MA graduate in political science and currently is an independent professional consultant in the fields of democratic participation, communications and outreach, 
and civil society capacity building, specializing in media literacy, rule of law, and active citizenship. Uh, we have Bernard Gatka, who is a French journalist and was elected as a member of the European Parliament this year. Uh, until the European Parliament, he worked for leading newspapers and media outlets focusing on international relations, foreign affairs, and conflict zones, and now he's a member of the Renew Europe Group. We have Michal Simečka, who is a Slovak politician, vice chairman of the political party Progressive Slovakia, and a member of the European Parliament. Earlier, he was worked as an analyst in London, as well as lecturer in Prague and in Bratislava, and uh, we had the pleasure to welcome him earlier as a member, as a, as a guest of uh, one of our earlier events in Budapest. Um, um, instead of Katka uh, who had to cancel this event at the very last moment, we have Daniel Miketz, uh, who is graduated as political scientist at the Östersjöland University Budapest. And since 2015, he is a researcher at the Republican Institute. From 2010, he holds various courses at this university on uh, protest movements and political participation. And finally, uh, István Hegedűs, who is a sociologist, chairman of the Hungarian Europe Society, and a former member of the first free elected Hungarian parliament, and uh, also served at that time as the vice chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee. Um, we have roughly um, 70 minutes uh, to discuss the most relevant questions, and then we will have like another half an hour for a Q&A session. Um, my first question uh, for all of you would be that in the European Union in general, and narrowly in the region of Central uh, Europe, how can we evaluate the danger and relevance of populist authoritarian regimes. And um, another question related to this, that is there a general populist threat? Is there a general populist wave? Or can we see any local patterns? So for example, is there any similarities or differences between uh, the Hungarian and the Polish case? Uh, I think uh, from uh, if we use a broader scientific approach, uh, I think it's worth to, to consider the categories of, uh, of populism, uh, which was elaborated by Cass Mude. And I think uh, there's, a, there's the agrarian populism, uh, which was very typical in the end of the 19th century in Russia and uh, also in, in the USA, according to Cass Mudde. And also in your research paper, you are writing about the cleavage, the center periphery cleavage, uh, which is typical in Hungarian politics. And uh, you are claiming that, that Orban and the Fidesz uses this cleavage. Uh, they also, I think, amplifies this cleavage, uh, of course, because they are a political party, so they use this, uh, uh, they're using sort of social cleavages and conflicts for their own benefit. But my point is here that actually I think this, uh, the Fidesz populism reminds this agrarian populism in a certain way that it also, um, it also focuses on, on, on the conflicts between the center and the periphery. This is actually what we are seeing. And I think the municipal election is also, uh, uh, it also highlights this, this, this difference between uh, uh, urban areas and rural areas in Hungary. I think the, uh, the Polish populism uh, is more like uh, a social populism, uh, where it was very important for the Fidesz party uh, supporting uh, this, this, this children money, supporting families. And when it comes to Western uh, uh, populism in Western Europe, I think it's more about the uh, US skepticism. Um, this, this third one is the, uh, according to Kass Mudde, this is, this is what the, the basic idea of contemporary populism. Uh, blaming the EU, uh, scapegoating the EU, and Euro skepticism. So I think these are the uh, these are the three uh, main forms of populism in our region. But of course, uh, also the the Polish government blames the EU, the Hungarian government blames the EU. So uh, these are not uh, very clear categories. But I think it's open. It's very important to reflect upon these differences. 
uh, which is actually, I think, important for, for, uh, for uh, liberal political forces, also for, for civil society initiatives, how to combat populism, how to challenge populism, because they are different. Um, so there was a question about or. So is this like local or is this global? I think that we stick to or things a little bit too much and sometimes think that it's very complex. So I think there's no or, this or that. I think this is a multidimensional multi situation and depends from the country, the proportion of global impact towards the local impact is different. And it's very hard, hard to grasp to see what is predominant factor in this country or that country but I think we should look at all the measure of populism as processes that crosses each other and finding what is the proportion in order to tackle it. Because there is no like, you can say, okay, in Poland I agree obviously the social health was a big factor, but obviously there are so many layers of different categories why the populism could thrive there that this one factor would not be able to push it if other layers weren't there. So like in my opinion, this is like both answers are actually very correct. So we can see, for instance, in the um, elections in Poland now, in parliamentary elections, that there is the same trend as in some of the European country or European parliament, that you see that the right and left or the new forces of the right wing or the left like greens do melt the center. So this is for sure in all the countries also with that. But then it's the proportion is a little bit different and of course, Still, the European elections in Poland were not European elections. So you had the global trend, so the melting the center and the traditional parties that hold the power, but at the same time, the European elections was nothing about Europe, believe me. I was also running this election for one of the former MEPs, and the only issues how, we, how the votes were uh, passing, let's say, was about the local issues, about whether the law and justice is supported yet or not, about the argument between the party, about the little affairs of every day. So it's actually interesting to see that you have the global result and then no European election on the ground. And I don't have answer because I'm, I'm sorry, I would want to have it, but I think it's case by case and it's about the proportion to look how the different levels cross each other. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you very much uh, again for um, inviting me and it's, it's, it's great to be here and also because I'm a Slovak and um, it's I think my political party and me personally always um, felt that because the populists and, and the would-be uh, authoritarians of our region um, often cooperate and exchange ideas and, and strategies and so should you know so we should do the same there are the political actors and parties and or civil society actors who who strive for a, um, kind of a European liberal democratic uh, politics should also cooperate much more. So which is why um, um, our, my party is very close links with Momentum, not just within the ALDE, um, within the ALDE party, but also bilaterally we campaign together um, in the European elections, uh, also there participating in our events in our national elections, which are up in February. So this is just a message that um, I think we also should remember from the you know the, the, the 80s when uh, when all of these countries were somehow trying to and, and the dissident networks within all of these countries were cooperating because they had a shared goal so I think that's um, that the first thing I wanted to say that, that for me as, as a Slovak this is uh, this is crucially important and I feel the, the Hungarian struggle as, as in, to a large extent my own um, the other thing um, and that's responding to, to the question of course I mean some of the um, the context is global European it's um, you know, the economic crisis and its aftermath, obviously migration crisis, which affected all of Europe and all of Europe's political systems and gave kind of rise to, uh, to much more fervent right-wing uh, populism. So that's kind of common to every, uh, to every EU member state with the possible exception of Portugal um, and, and some other EU member states. Uh, so so there, are, there are these, kind of the, the, there are these uh, wider trends and there are obviously national variants of, of these populist movements. As, as we pointed out, the Polish one is different from, um, from the Hungarian one. Um, and then there is obviously Czech variant and, and, and the Slovak one. Now, what I think, uh, I mean, what I'm actually, to be honest, I'm kind of also tired of, of, of talking for the past three years about a populist wave and a right-wing populist wave, because frankly speaking, uh, it is true in some countries, and 
Um, but it's, I think we, we passed that, it seems to me, at least in, even, in Central, uh, even in Central Europe. Even in, in my country, uh, there was a sort of a surge of, of uh, there is still a surge of the fascist party, and there is obviously some support for nationalist politics, but overwhelmingly in the European elections, and most likely in these national elections, I mean, people vote for pro-European, broadly speaking, liberal democratic political parties, and all the opinion polls, even in, in Poland and Hungary, consistently show that these are the most pro-European countries when it comes to public attitude. Uh, and even in, in the Czech Republic, uh, there was also fears that, that the prime minister would sort of align himself with the far right, which to some extent he did, and that Czech Republic would be another country to succumb to this um, kind of you know, semi-democratic or hybrid regime type, which it didn't. Uh, I, so, so I think it's, it's kind of becoming, um, it, talking about a, a sort of a far right populist wave, I think is blinding us to the reality, which is much, much more complex. And even in Central Europe, I think there are forces on the rise, which are liberal, which are pro-European, which are green, which have succeeded in the, national, uh, in the municipal elections in Hungary, which have elected Zuzana Chaputova, the president of Slovakia, and that's you know, a majority of the entire country in, in direct elections, which I think will prevail in the national elections, which are also becoming stronger in Poland. So, so I would just sort of caution against um, that uh, you know, simplistic view that we're somehow all you know, being overwhelmed by the populist tide. Um, and so far, all of you uh, mentioned the European parliamentary elections. Uh, let me add uh, just one uh, sub-question. <laughs> uh, that after the European parliamentary elections, what do you think that the European populist wave has actually been stopped, or is it still the most severe crisis in the whole EU? Uh, I, I, I'm sorry to to be a little bit provocative, if not cruel. I, I don't like the word populism. Uh, I try not to use it, which is very difficult, which is very difficult. But I try to, to avoid to, to do so because I don't know the meanings of this word. I, I never understood why. Uh, when I was uh, in Moscow at the end of the USSR uh, and of communism, uh, it was the, the beginning of Yeltsin rise. Uh, and uh, the, the Russian uh, uh, journalist and political scientist, uh, the, the French, the American, British, everybody, everybody uh, used to say that he was a populist. What do you mean? I, I never understood. He was an alcoholic, for sure. He was completely idiotic, for sure. He was uh, on the hand of uh, his daughter and uh, what was his name? The guy who was killed in London? Uh, no, 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 no. An, an oligarch, uh, let's forget his name, and so on and so on. Uh, but populist, why? No, I, I, I never understood. There is now, in all the countries, on all the continents, a deep crisis of the old and traditional political forces, basically, the conservative and the progressive, basically the social democracy and the Christian Democrats, in the US, the Democrats and the Republicans, and so on and so on. Well, the political forces who organize the world and uh, the countries uh, are now in a deep crisis because they don't have uh, anything to say. Simply, they don't have anything to say. And so the, the people are searching desperately for new political forces. And I will be very shocking, I'm sorry. But those new political forces could be Orban or Daesh, could 
be uh, Macron or Trump, could be uh, Kaczynski or, help me, uh, who else? I don't know. Uh, very different people, very different political positions. But what they have in common? They are the incarnation of this search for new political posters. And it will last. Of course, it will last. Just have a look at Ukraine. I was there in, uh, with a mission of the, of the parliament, of the European parliament on Friday. Uh, it was astonishing for me to uh, see and to, to realize how much uh, Mr. Uh, Zelensky remembered me, Mr. Macron, and is en marche. It's exactly the same phenomena. They, they, they came from nowhere. They came from nowhere. Uh, they are very young. They were not linked with any political force uh, in their countries. And they organized a new political party, which won a strong majority in the parliament, Ukrainian or French. And now this, uh, these new political forces in France and in Ukraine are more and more divided because, uh, well, uh, one man invented them uh, in 48 hours or something like that. Uh, and they don't have a lot in common. And the Ukrainian society is probably as the French society, already searching for a new new, if you understand me, for a new new. And so this phenomenon will last. But let's be a little bit more concrete. We all know in this room that there is almost nothing in common between Mr. Kaczynski and Mr. Orban. Almost nothing. Well, there are something in common their common hostility toward Brussels, their common problems with the Commission and the Parliament and uh, almost everybody except the PPE in, uh, in the European Union. But after that, I'm, so, no, no, I'm not sorry because we, we agree on that. There is nothing in common between them. And even between Mr. Orban and Mr. Putin, I wouldn't say there is a lot in common, maybe a little bit more, because after all, the man who really invented uh, la démocratie illibérale was Putin and not Orban, and not uh, this uh, uh, American communist, not at all, not at all. It was Putin. And what is the démocratie illibérale? A very simple thing. Uh, a regime with election, mm, election uh, with, uh, what is it in English, to somebody could help me, avec une fraude électorale. Electoral fraud. It's always easier <laughs> than I think, okay. Maybe with no electoral fraud, it does exist. It does exist. Uh, after all, in Poland, the elections were not fraudulent. And we saw the result. And we saw the result in Hungary. And we saw the result in Budapest and Ankara. And we would have seen the result in Moscow if the election wasn't completely fraudulent in Russia. Now, last point. I'm sorry to be a little too long, but last point. Have, let's have a look at this situation. Are those new political forces, specifically the illiberal ones, majoritarian in their countries? No. They are the strongest party, but they are not majoritarian. 
never 41, ne, ne, never 52, 50, or, or 51. And as, uh, as soon as uh, all the political forces opposed to Orban, to uh, Erdogan, he went to Putin in St. Petersburg, in Moscow, uh, Gorky, you know, Gorky now is again in Nizhny Novgorod, uh, <laughs> etc. Uh, et we see where is the real majority. So, one question. Could those political forces opposed to this new kind of dictators, because this is a new kind of dictators, this is not Pinochet, it's much more complex, could those political forces um, give birth to a real political forces almost united? I don't know. The feeling of many people in Budapest, I understand, is more and more than the answer would be yes. I don't know. We'll see. But the fact is that in London, today, the mood is everybody, anybody, but Johnson. And so I will vote for anybody completely opposed to my ideas, even for Corbyn if I am a Lib Dem, even if uh, uh, for a Lib Dem if I am a Corbynite, uh, and so on and so on. But it was exactly the, the smart vote invented a few weeks ago by Navalny in Moscow. It was exactly that. And it was exactly what you did in Budapest. So there is also there a new trend which we could study and uh, about which we could, uh, we should, Definitely think over. I'm sorry to, for having you long. Mark Tajina would like to react uh, briefly, and then we will pass the microphone to Istvan. Uh, so I not fully agree with the, with the analysis here. This is democracy, you are Yes, free. and that's a debate, so that's why. So uh, definitely, like, new parties or new political actors were in search. But I think that was not about actor or stakeholder, but a new response, or the accurate response to the crisis. And I think this precise um, look at this makes a bit of difference, because if the old parties, and I will explain in an example, old traditional parties that were on the market, generated the accurate, fresh, and new response to the crisis that they were surprised by, for many reasons. So, so in my country, because they were a little bit taking things for granted, because they were maybe not evaluating with the same you know, urgency of the political situation, of the emotional situation of the society, of the need of the society. So obviously, being in this like not aware, not aware moment, they lost because they didn't generate the right strong response to the new world. So I would say that it's more about defining the new response that could be by the traditional parties, traditional meanings on the market or a new party, but bringing a fresh and accurate response people looking for. So if this response gonna come, for instance now, uh, the coalition, uh, so the like former civic platform, obviously took first, uh, not the, um, when the uh, law and justice won, but the previous elections of the president for granted, they didn't do a good campaign, they didn't really, you know, sell themselves or look for the voters because they were just so little bit used to, in some way, that that's how it, how it is. But now, why we were saying here, okay, it's changed, we are not in this populist wave anymore, because for the three years, for instance, in Poland and four, like, opposition learned some lessons. So actually, they did generate some responses for the four years, they analyzed it, they said, okay, we cannot be, for instance, now, civic, uh, coalition take uh, civic movements on board, the left uh, is a big coalition for the free leftist parties, just 
two years ago, they would just absolutely say, we not going to cooperate and so on. So what we're seeing is a new response of either new actors or either or actors. But my point is, I think for all the political behaviors, is just to be very observatory towards what the electorate is doing and generating right responses. And I don't think it's a search for new, you know, in the actual way, but in the response way. So it could come from anyone, as long as it's accurate, as it's strong, and as it's relevant for the audience. Maybe I start with the word populism, uh, and I join Dania that there was a long debate, certainly since Yasin or even before, how to use this term. But I think by now there is a sort of agreement that uh, populism is not a cure, but more a threat to liberal democracy. And maybe Yasin would not count into that sort of definition. And I agree with you in that sense that maybe the word populism is not the best, and uh, that's why we use authoritarianism and uh, different similar categories, because I'm not sure which word would fit best. But how we use the term populism, maybe let's use it this uh, way, uh, is talking about a regime in the case of Hungary and maybe in the case of Poland, which really wants to undermine liberal democracy, which is really a threat to the values what we probably all uh, share. And uh, what I think that uh, even if there are very good uh, development recently, you know, Slovakia, certainly the best example, or Macron from a liberal perspective, and so on. But I think there are ups and downs. So maybe in 2017 or 16, or after the peak of the refugee crisis, we were much more pessimistic. Maybe this year we are more optimistic because Salvini is not in power, but he might come back, as we all know, maybe in a very soon. Uh, so I think it's not over. So my message would be maybe that although I talk a lot about hope, unfortunately in Hungary we have an illiberal regime. Uh, in Poland, the regime actually has been more or less strengthened by the European elections, although not completely because of the vote in the, for the Senate, so it's also a little bit, there is some hope in Poland as well, but it's not over. And since we don't know what comes next, and because everything is so fragile, what you, when you talked about uh, new politicians uh, who come to surface uh, in a minute, or quite suddenly, and uh, a totally new play field when uh, Boris Johnson becomes the enemy and everybody is on the other side. So things have changed and the old party systems are not so stable anymore like uh, a couple of years ago. I think populists or illiberals or anti-liberals might also win and we might, uh, uh, and I think that's important, we might take it into account that this wave, maybe it's a little bit down, but it's not over. And I just, last sentence, because I think that today, maybe in Brussels or in some other capitals, Orban is much less relevant than a year ago. And that's very good, but it doesn't mean that the problem is over. And maybe the new commission, the parliament, should go on dealing with the reasons why these dangerous guys became so strong recently, why are they still in, in political position, and to block them in the future, not to have even more influence, or not to come back, and one la very last sentence is about the European People's Party, because Bernard mentioned them. Certainly it would be very important from a Hungarian perspective, I mean from a perspective who, of those who do not support Orban, Orban is not Hungary, as we all know, uh, that the EPP should kick out Orban and then we have a much more clear picture who belongs to the mainstream, who is supported by uh, mainstream politicians and political parties, including the, the center right, and who is out of that group of mainstream democratic political uh, parties and politicians. So I think that would help a lot Nobody is here from the EPP, but I think that's an important message again. Um, the last two sentences from Istvan uh, lead us uh, to a next question. That uh, how do you see, what do you think, that what the European institutions 
and the European political actors can do uh, in case uh, basic common European values are breached within the EU. And I'll pick up directly what, uh, what each one has left. And I think the entire conceptual semantic uh, discussion that we had between, you know, on the difference between populism and, and illiberal democracy and, and or authoritarianism, I think, first of all, um, populism is not a regime. It's, uh, if at best, and if we accept, I don't know, Jan Werner Müller's definition, whatever, it's a, it's a description of political activeness. Regime type is very different, and I think this ties into what you were uh, asking about what the European Union should do. I think we should simply um, accept the fact that there will be, as always were, and will be populist movements. Some, at some point they'll be in power, at some point they'll be in the opposition. They will be anti-European, they will certainly be anti-liberal, um, or will be, and I think that's becoming more and more relevant. They will be climate, climate skeptic, they will be the fighting against uh, all efforts to contain climate crisis. Uh, and some, sometimes, as, in, as they are today, in, say, Poland, they will be in power. Um, at some point, they'll be in opposition. Now, this, the European Union can live with, because uh, this is what democratic politics is still about. What, what it cannot live with, and what the European Union cannot tolerate, is different regime types among its member states. And I think that, that's where the crucial distinction should be. I even was asked, I remember on, 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 the, on a similar debate a couple of, uh, couple of days back in, in Hamburg, there was an American um, uh, academic, American political scientist who asked him, you know, what's the problem? Why can't the European Union simply accept that there will be um, semi-democratic or even authoritarian member states? I mean, the US for, for a long period of time uh, tolerated the fact that some of the US states were openly racist in their legislation, and, uh, um, and it was kind of, you know, the United States functioned well, they had a war, but then, you know, it was even, even after the war, there were just some member states, especially in some countries or states, especially in the South, were, were definitely illiberal. Um, I, my, my argument is that the European Union, first of all, is, uh, is a different political entity than the US, and a lot, and it's not most of uh, decision making is done thanks to the trust between member states, the mutual trust between member states and their leaders, and their trust is based on the fact that they're all you know, Democrats where rule of, rule of law and, and uh, fundamental freedoms are observed. So I think this is why the EU, as it is currently set up, and even <coughs> in practical terms, cannot uh, tolerate going forward you know, dictatorship among its, um, uh, among its leaders, because it will break down. Now, what to do with it, and I kind of will be um, tooting my own horn a bit, because that's also what our political group, uh, the Renew Europe, uh, are demanding what I'll, you know, the file that I'll be rapporteur for is to have, uh, in addition to what we have today, Article Seven procedures or infringement proceedings, um, and you know, possible budgetary conditionality. I think the EU needs a comprehensive monitoring mechanism of the performance and observance of rule of law, democracy, and fundamental rights in all its member states, based on a single methodology, which where the criteria are clear and the process is seen as impartial. And the reason why this needs to be done and this needs to be put in place is precisely because uh, the, the situation that where we have today, when there are Article 7 proceedings against, against Hungary and Poland, these countries, and Orban does it fairly, fairly frequently, almost all the time, would always argue that this is selective, that this is politically motivated, and that the Commission is just trying to punish Hungary for its anti-migration position, or for its kind of nationalism, or for its ideology. And that shouldn't be the case. It should be clear that the process is, uh, is objective, impartial, and seen as legitimate. That's why it needs to apply to all the, to all the member states on a regular basis with monitoring. And we might find that even some older member states have problem with the rule of law, thinking about, well, who knows, in which, you know, even I think um, the UK at the time, in September, the suspension of the UK Parliament, I think that also uh, opens up questions about the rule of law in the United Kingdom, but that's, I guess, you know, besides the point, can they leave it? So I think this is, this is going forward, this is the answer. It's because at some point after the Second World War, the European project, the EU, and has sort of uh, diverged from, uh, from these sort of values and, and political aspects that was kind of for the Council of Europe to deal with, democracy, human rights, and the EU was dealing with you know, regulation, single markets, but still 
and, and the coal and the you know, coal regions and all that. But I think that this element of rule of law, European values needs to be more explicitly inscribed in the European project, not to be left for the Council of Europe. Uh, and that would be the answer. Um, Danny, I would like to react. So uh, I will pass the microphone uh, for him. But let me add just one kind of sub question, if uh, anyone from the panel would like to answer it. That uh, how do you see what are your prediction in connection with the Article 7 procedures? So, uh, what can be the outcomes? Uh, what can what can we expect from these uh, Article 7 procedures? Um, obviously, you can react uh, for the previous uh, uh, previous talks, and if you would like, you can also answer this last question. I think that the Article 7 is it's not going to work. Uh, because uh, Poland uh, and Hungary is there, so they're gonna uh, save uh, each other in this process. But I think that's what is more important is uh, what actually was said, that uh, uh, what, what is behind the European Union is that it has an ideology, that the European project have its values. And I think it's very important because sometimes we, we tend to forget it. We, and I think if, if the institutions are not working, but it's also very hard to change the institutional framework because then you, you have to change uh, actually all the, all the contracts. Uh, like uh, there was a plan that there should be some prerequisites in order to have the, uh, the uh, structural funds, like uh, rule of law. But it, it could also, also couldn't work without uh, changing the, the contracts, the basis of the European Union and the, and the institutional framework. But I think for many people, and uh, I, I, I speaking from, from the Hungarian experience, for a lot of people, of course, Europe is about uh, traveling uh, uh, without borders or, or, or having a job in, in Germany or, or in, in the UK, maybe not, in, not anymore. But I think for a lot of uh, people in Hungary, Europe also means something else. It means that we belong to the West. And, and we tend to, to forget it. Uh, uh, five years ago, uh, at the, during the so-called internet tax protests, people chanted Europe, Europe, Europe on the streets of Budapest. And I think it's very important that uh, the Article 7 process is good to, to uh, taking uh, control of the debate. That, uh, that the pro-European forces are also here going into a conflict with uh, with the uh, uh, EU destructive forces. Uh, because if you don't, in, in politics, conflict is essential. If you avoid co uh, conflicts, uh, you, can, uh, you cannot win. You cannot be successful in politics. And I think this is, this is the, uh, an important point to demonstrate for pro-European voters in Hungary or in Poland that the EU is ready to defend these very core values. And I think at the end of the day, of course, what matters is uh, the election results in, uh, in the member state. And I think if, if uh, there's a pro-European movement, uh, it could help to be successful at the member state elections against uh, the EU destructive political forces. Um, so I want to underline how crucial for Poland it was to have European actors, institutions involved. If, uh, if the, uh, the, um, the bill on the justice system weren't passed, were directed from the Commission to the European Court of Justice, we would have much more horrible law uh, on the justice system right now on the Supreme Court. In fact, we can say that because this happened, it saved a little piece of this battlefield. Obviously, this is not a, <laughs> you know, it's not saving the whole country and the whole system and the whole values. But definitely, we like, also because I'm speaking from the activist part, uh, side, so this long explanation of my title, I was working between civic movement and institutions, EU institutions, because I could be there on the ground as alliance with different actors, so I had the chance to see Mr. Timmermans, uh, Tusk, and also work, Mr. Tusk, and also work on the, um, on the grounds, uh, on the uh, changing of the funds for the civil society as well. So also for activist groups, different activist groups that are present in Poland uh, from 2016, the end of the 2016, having the support of different actors of the opinion, being heard, being treated seriously, psychologically speaking, it was what you were before was saying about the psychological aspects of these actions were huge for the society that reads. And now I tell you like funny fun fact, 
recently there was the, uh, the, the description of the problem between the government and the justice system, the infringement of the, uh, of the impartially and, and independently on the gossip magazine in Poland. I think that was just a beautiful uh, peak of what happens in this country and it was great because that's where it has to be. I mean, gossip magazines about celebrities and there is an article about the justice system. And because in there, there is European Union did this and commission was this and the people met, it, does a, it does give a confirmation for people who are not interested that there is something serious going on. So I think with this, with the, without this support, on the psychological level, on the legal level, we would be in much, much worse place. So that's why. And second thing is that, like also something that we didn't talk about it, and I think maybe also not sufficiently in general in public sphere, is about the strategic capacity building and funding of the new forces that are being uh, created. Because what happened when the uh, democracy broke in Poland? I, we, I could not find any founding sources in European Union that could help the civic movement because we were not legible, because we didn't have the records, because we didn't have million nice fancy projects going all around the world in the capital. It was so frustrating to see different actors and say, how is this possible that we don't have funding response to the such crisis that we have money to travel to Paris to have intercultural exchange over coffee and we cannot fund people who have to build the structures, work 24 hours per day, have no capacities, no knowledge, have no money because you know if you're organizing processes like on the long term every day, you can work normally, you know. I cannot take normal work if I wanna ha help civic movement and uh, it's not about me, it's me or people, you know. So I think that was interesting and I think this is, uh, uh, there was a right and values instrument uh, proposal that was voted uh, by the parliament, we're gonna see what's gonna happen uh, like in the, because it was in the present term. But you know, after four years, I mean, that's great, but this is important, like, okay, we can be on the political level, but if there is a motion, pro-democratic motion, in their new forces, they have to get the support directly, and it has to be not only psychological support, but it has to be funding, there has to be capacity, training, uh, how to speak, how to prepare yourself to the very exhausting fight with very well prepared and founding people, like government that has all resources to push the propaganda or so on. If you would like to yeah. react just to your very last question about Article 7 in a broader sense, what the EU can do, because we already had uh, quite a lot of events organized on that very specific issues uh, many years ago or in the very last years, and the answer might change a little bit because I think it's a little bit too late retrospectively. Certainly it would have been much better in case the EU institutions would have reacted in 2011 or 2012 in a more direct and rapid way to, to the populist uh, challenge or threat. But anyway, we are now here, and I think it's still important to put pressure on Orban, Kaczynski, and anybody else who dares to think about to follow their examples, even if the outcome is questionable. It, I think the process is, by now, much more important since uh, and the ongoing uh, pressure means that the Hungarian government, for example, today has to defend itself at the council, the Polish government, I think, as well, which creates a framework what can be used by the opposition, by civil society, at least showing that we are not alone. There are others in Europe, in Brussels, in Paris, everywhere, who support our cause. It's not because we are in opposition and we hate Orban or we hate Kaczynski, but because we have an, a very strong issue which is supported by the pro-European mainstream from everywhere. This sort of solidarity, I think it's very important for a much more uh, talented and now much more confident opposition in Poland than in Hungary and maybe elsewhere, could argue that Orban is the problem. We should blame Orban and we shouldn't blame Brussels. I think when it get, when politics becomes so simplistic, either you, either us, then it's important to have good arguments showing that this is the issue, not the framework what 
all of them tries to make there are the forces who fight against us, what Nihal mentioned, because we support migration or whatever. No, because the main issue is, let's say, democracy, rule of law, constitution, human rights, and so on. And all civilized forces in Europe and beyond support us and criticize Orban Kaczynski. So I think the process is even more important, even if the outcome is not evident at all. Just before Bernard, yes. um, as, the, as the time flies, and uh, we will open the, the floor for the question, uh, let me add uh, my last question, and obviously you can react for the previous talk. So my last question would be, as we have two members of the European Parliament, and we have uh, three panelists from the NGO sector, so it will be um, a quite of a divided question, that um, um, as you are from the Renew Europe group, what does renewal mean for you, and what does renewal mean for Europe? And for the, for the NGO experts, my question would be that how can and how will the civil groups and civil movement um, influence the political processes uh, in the future. Um, but first, Bernard, the floor is yours now. Well, um, nowadays, the majority of the European people regard uh, the European Union, and they, they don't say the European Union, they say Brussels, which doesn't mean anything, by the way, but they say Brussels. They regard Brussels as a bureaucracy, inefficient, completely inefficient, uh, extremely cost costly, which is not at all, but they regard that like that. And uh, they think that this is a tool in the hand of uh, the big capitalists uh, to uh, uh, destroy uh, every uh, social law and the welfare state in the countries of the European Union. This is the regard of the majority of the people and uh, we have to know that and to be conscious of, of, of that. So what could we do? Uh, first to show that the European Union can be, is, and is efficient, and can be much more efficient in fields uh, that are the most important for, uh, for the, the majority of our citizens. The question of uh, inequality is growing on all the continents, and specifically in Europe. Uh, the people tend to reject, not to accept, such a gap between the richest and the poorest. We have to give answers on that, because this is a fact that this situation is unacceptable is unacceptable. If we don't understand that, uh, I, I, I don't think uh, the European Union could uh, uh, last for uh, centuries and centuries. Not at all, not at all. We have to answer the biggest questions. And uh, the people need also protection against the uncertainties of this world. And we have to show, we got to show uh, that with a, a common European defense, with a common European uh, diplomacy, with a common European action on the international stage, we can protect together our nations and our population. In one word, we got to act and to answer the questions. If we stay in this uh, situation of lethargy, 
in which we are for now almost 12 years, we will commit suicide. We will commit suicide. Uh, I was a journalist for 50 years. I decided to enter into politics because I was completely convinced that we got to act and was a critic before a big catastrophe. Before a big catastrophe. So this is my answer about, on, on your question, what is renew Europe? Thank you. Uh, Smira has to leave a bit earlier due to some other commitments. Uh, now the uh, microphone is yours. And uh, as you have to leave immediately, thank you for coming. And we will continue with the other panelists. Uh, uh, yes, and I do apologize um, for uh, I had to be immediately followed and back at five o'clock. But and that for the same reason, I won't give um, kind of a long uh, political message, you know, a long speech full of political messages about the priorities of our political group and what it means to be a renewing Europe. And I'm, I'm sure there'll be uh, you'll hear plenty of plenty of that now. Uh, but yeah, I, I think that uh, it seems to me. Personally, for, for me, there are some things that, obviously, inequality is a huge problem. Obviously, the, the inability of the EU to have a coherent uh, security policy and act in the world, uh, that's a huge problem. But I think there are a couple of things, characteristics that make Europe, and to use a very controversial term, European way of life, distinctive. And this is also where I, I think the EU and this commission should sort of uh, give priority. Uh, one. I would think is a is a you know a carbon neutral continent by 2050. That's very good and a very European ambition. I would think um, the other is setting the standards for um, for its, its you know liberty and individual privacy in, a, in the digital world and making the most of the opportunities that come with uh, you know from artificial intelligence. But at the same time, setting a European standard, which would, as it often happens then, uh, is taken up as a, as a global standard and, and inspires the regulation of across the world. I think that's another, where it's another priority, which is distinctively European, which I think makes, uh, where it makes sense that the EU uh, acts decisively and one of its group priorities. Uh, and the other, and that's the final one, of course, is liberal democracy. Uh, the, Euro the European Union, apart from being a, you know, a single market and and um, a passport-free zone without without border check is uh, a club of liberal democracy, um, and this is where renewing Europe also means restoring uh, restoring that state of affairs and making sure that the EU remains uh, a space where freedom and liberal democracy and kind of civic participation and human dignity prevail. And that's unfortunately that means renewing. So that would be, I guess, my my brief answer, and I do apologize for having having to leave you shortly, but I wish you a good discussion. Thank you, thank you for coming. And uh, Dania doesn't have to leave, but uh, uh, he he would like to react. So now the microphone is for him. Thank you very much. Um, so the question was, what can the NGOs do? Uh, I think the NGOs they are already doing their job. You know, they give voice for the uh, for the weak. Uh, they are, they are uh, publishing policy papers. Uh, I think the NGOs in Hungary, for instance, they are, uh, they are also doing a lot of job in, in Brussels as well, uh, as they are uh, commenting uh, uh, always the, the government's excuses and uh, pinpointing on the areas where the government is, uh, is just not respecting uh, uh, European values or human rights. But I think what is, uh, what is more important at this phase is not uh, uh, discussing the duty of NGOs, but uh, more like focusing on what the citizens can do. Because I think uh, what would be important that, um, so also in, in Hungary, opposition voters, in a lot of cases, they are very dissatisfied with their own parties or with the opposition politicians. We know very well that the context has been changing. Uh, you also talked about how the Nowadays, the like the public sphere uh, has been changed. Uh, people have more uh, voice. Uh, also, the education level is also rises. So people are always dissatisfied with the political output 
Uh, Pierre Rosevalon, for instance, he wrote about this, this development. And I think that uh, the people, uh, uh, people have to understand that uh, it, it's also their duty to participate in politics and, and maybe help their parties, not just always blaming the opposition politicians for being lame and, and being incompetent, but somehow try to, uh, try to uh, uh, promote agency uh, uh, in the case of political parties and, and, and listen to the political parties. What we saw at the European election in this May, that those two parties been successful in Hungary, the Democratic Coalition and the Momentum Party, which had a very clear pro-European agenda, I mean among the opposition parties, and also which had a, a very important pool of activists, core activists, who, who, who helped these parties during the campaign. And also we saw at the municipal election that, uh, uh, for example, in a district of Budapest, the eight districts I'm talking about, Jorja uh, Faros, where the Fidesz was very strong, an opposition candidate could win with the help of civil activists. Uh, and these are people who are not uh, organizing an NGO, they are not members of uh, institutionalized uh, organizations, they are just ordinary people, citizens, who've been dissatisfied with the local government, so they decided to act. And I think it's very important to have a new bond between uh, opposition voters and political parties. There are actually some, uh, some good examples, uh, like the Momentum Party, they have their uh, subgroups in, uh, in the Hungarian countryside, they are active there. So I think what would be important, um, not just focusing on the NGOs and civil society, but to tell people that it doesn't work without you. You should also have to do your job. Katarzyna? Uh, yeah, I'm super eager to respond to this. Um, so I think that maybe we should not divide NGOs and peaceful citizens as being on the other side or not the same, because from what I observe, I think it's a little bit like uh, one one thing, if you know what I mean. So maybe NGO is for you more in more with a tradition and record and more institution status and so on. So what happened in Poland, which I think is extremely fascinating, so the civic movement, the business world COD, so Committee of the Defense of Democracy, uh, but not also the uh, black women protest and uh, also a few other civic movements that become NGOs is because they need it for practical reasons, but obviously they didn't come from the NGO mindset, if you might say. They become a part of the public sphere. And when I say they become public of, uh, a part of public sphere, I don't mean that they were only on the street, which is a big thing, but they were considered in the media, so there was a debate, there was a representative. They were uh, being a part of the uh, talks between coalitions of the party, because we demanded this, civic society said, no, you cannot have this discussion between biggest parties or coalitions, we have to be there. Uh, so they were sometimes being considered in the election polls. So we don't speak about just, uh, not just, I don't want to say just, but they become a part of the public sphere view of a horizon. So you have political parties, uh, you have NGOs, and you have civic movements that have a voice, that have a power, that if uh, the leader of the civic movement says, well, I don't like Mr. Skadina, I think he should not be a leader of this party. Well, you don't want the civic uh, movement person to say it. Now, there one, person, uh, one of the leader of, there is a lot of them, so I don't want to name uh, all, the, uh, all the groups, uh, he, he went to, um, to be also a, a candidate, he wanted to candidate against a coalition, so pro-democratic party leader, because he said, well, there should be pre-elections in the democratic parties, and if you don't do pre-elections, I'm gonna candidate, because I think that's what we have to do. And he forced the debates that were all in media and all the, in the press as a civic activist. So I think in Poland, it, it made a huge impact. And also when the elections to the parliament started, like all my social media were with, uh, with the activists doing campaign and starting in elections. And I think this is amazing. I mean, people from the street who actually work hard from NGOs, they don't think like, okay, you know, political life is all for these people who just like, you know, this bias, uh, politics is for egoistic people. No, politics is for us. And not only street is for us. We can actually get elected uh, and vote and be responsible. So I think this will happen in Poland. Like, it's, it's really amazing. Like, there's a lot of activists from many different uh, groups that are actually in parliament that uh, also won in the local elections. And I think this is the biggest win that Kaczynski gave to Poland. 
just uh, two points. One is uh, that Bernard and also Michal talked about issues which are so fascinating and really very important. Number one issues, climate change, digitalization, in, uh, inequalities, all social problems. But unfortunately, I feel a little bit like 40, 50 years ago when I listen to someone who comes from a liberal democracy and where I live now in a non-liberal democracy, the issues are again much more simplistic. But, and we what we tried in our report to speak about uh, all these policy areas, what in theory a next democratic government should do. And then we talked about the similar issues, what, what you mentioned, but first the precondition of that to be able to have a Hungarian uh, public debate on uh, climate change, on education and healthcare, to get back or to renew and to have a liberal democracy. Until then, we will have our obsession, who is against Orban, who is with Orban. If it doesn't go back to a normal situation, then we will be able to focus on the even more important issues like what happens to our globe and etc. Until then, we will have our obsession and we will have a very much uh, focused debate on certainly very important issues. I don't mean the democracy and rule of law are not important issues, but it, it blocks me in a way, in a box, where the only issue is who is with him, who is against him. So that's first certainly what we need to get rid of this very polarized situation and to get back to normal liberal democracy. And my second point is about civil society and, uh, and politics for the future. I think there was a learning process to use what Katarzyna said about the Polish opposition. It, it was a learning process not only for the Hungarian political parties, what I mentioned, but for the civil society as well. We remember that there was a sort of uh, romantic view about the role of civil society and a sort of anti-party sentiments in both countries, I guess. Now, at the moment, I think it's a little bit over. And everybody realized that civil society, because it was oppressed by this political regime, Fidesz, a political party, if you want, although it's not our wish, or not the wish of many NGOs, to cooperate with any parties, but that's a sort of must, that now opposition, civil society, individuals uh, are on the same side, if you want. It doesn't mean that the uh, unity doesn't mean diversity. What you mentioned, that there should be an internal debate, maybe pre-elections, maybe different views, but at the end, again, we get back to, we need uh, to get rid of the current situation in order to have, a, again, a more beautiful democratic debate in Hungary and, I guess, in Poland, too. Just, uh, just to get back a little bit for this renewal question, I hope also there's an answer from a European identity perspective as well. Uh, so I would like to address this question to you and you can also react uh, for the previous talks if you want and then we will open the, the floor for the, for the questions from the audience. I disagree with you, uh, and I'm sorry to say so, but I completely disagree with you. Because if you find in Budapest or in Warsaw, in uh, Istanbul or in London, only about principles, ideas, values, it's wonderful, perfect for you and for me, for all of us in this room, I guess. But you have to make social and political alliances to win the majority in the parliament or to get elected your candidate for the presidency. And so you have to convince people that it would be their interest, that it would be their interest, social and financial interest, and not only in the sphere of values. 
why Mr. Kaczynski and his party are so popular in Poland? Well, a lot of reasons. But probably the, 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 the main reason is the fact that he decided to subsidize the families. And one of my closest friends in Warsaw, of course a liberal, of course a liberal, former dissident and so on, told me, Bernard, I have to tell you that on the beaches of uh, Chechen or uh, I mean the Baltic coast, you see now people who never went to swim in the Baltic. You never went to swim, to swim in the Baltic. And I'm sorry, but this is the main reason of the popularity of this party, of this majority. And uh, of course, there are many other reasons. Uh, the fight for morality, the, the fight against the decadence of the gay marriage, and so on and so on. Uh, the fight, the refusal to uh, uh, accept uh, refugees from the Middle East because they are Muslim and Arabs, uh, terrific things. And, and so on and so on. Of course, but basically, this is a question of money. Because those people needed badly money. And so we, we don't have, we the liberals, in France or in Poland and Hungary or everywhere, we, we don't have to think only about values. We have to fight for our values, this is clear. But we have also to make political alliances. I mean, after the war, there, there, there was in our country, I mean the European democracies and the United States, there was a clear alliance between the working people and their trade unions, and their trade unions, between those people and the middle class from the left or the right, but from the liberal side. And this alliance was the cement of the democracy, of progress, and everything, and everything. And by the way, was the cement of the victory against communism also, and mainly, I would say, and mainly. So let's not forget that. And uh, you have it, Sven, to speak now, not after winning the elections, to speak now about social issues, about poverty, about equality, about dignity, and so on and so on. Right now, don't wait. I'm sorry. Uh, now we have one mobile microphone and around 20 minutes for a Q&A session. Uh, so if you have any question, then please first introduce yourself. And I, now I won't be able to recall precisely the sentence from the president and rector of the Central European University, but the question is relatively short and ends with a question mark. So please bear in mind this, uh, this sentence. And then please. Hi, uh, Gar Garvin Walls from Unhack Democracy. Um, if you if you look at if you look at populist movements and study what they say beyond just the ideology, um, or sorry, beyond just things like you know being horrible to immigrants or whatever else it is, you you you, you find an, you find a theory of governance behind it, and they say that um, all these institutions that we build as liberals are get in the way of the relationship between the citizen and the government. They stop us hiring and firing them. And they say that their, their mission is to get rid of these intermediate institutions. They're pretty open about this. And to remove the power structures those institutions create. We, on the other hand, have forgotten that these liberal institutions are also uh, power structures, that they exist to enable the protection of rights, the protection of minorities, and the protection of um, pluralism in society. And that means that majorities sometimes need to be contained. And one of the reasons I think the EU has been relatively ineffective 
at dealing with these problems is because it is forgotten that there are ramparts to be manned and that there are institutions and values to be defended and, and it has hidden behind a technocracy that actually does itself a disservice. So my question um, is how, how can these arguments be made in a way that recognizes the inherently political nature of the challenge national populists pose to pluralist liberal democracy? Any other question? Let, let's uh, try to collect every question and then uh, all of you can react. Hi, Suzanne from ECHO 21 Conservancy. Thank you very much for inspiring, uh, mind-boggling uh, information. Uh, I was really stunned by all of your contributions question. Is um, we have now in Hungary uh, quite some mayors, liberal mayors, so in what way are you involving these actors on the local level uh, in all the considerations you have shared with us here, which are so uh, valid on European level, but we shouldn't forget, you know, it's the local level, it's where the citizens get engaged, where the citizens uh, learn what Europe means when it talks about values uh, connected to Equality measures. I, you know, I'm not used uh, so much to think about cohesion and equality as a liberal, I have to say, but I must say I have a feeling we have to get used to the wording and not only to the wording, but to the deeds uh, uh, to engage more into the thought and action of how to uh, achieve equality in the digital age. Uh, you just gave the answer to your question. Not really. I want to hear yours. <laughs> Thanks. You just gave it. We have another question. Yeah, uh, Martin Michelot. I work for Czech Think Tank called uh, Aerobeum, and I'm also an associate fellow at the Jacques Durel Institute in, uh, in, in Paris. Um, I should have a question for uh, Mr. Guetta, uh, is a French. Uh, how do you feel in the framework of this whole discussion that we've had when uh, the, the president in the interview for The Economist says that uh, there is certainly uh, a sort of connection uh, with uh, Prime Minister Orban, uh, at least in terms of, of dealing with, with Russia. And uh, do you feel that uh, this is something that uh, you know? Do you, is this something that you you can accept uh, that uh, you know prime, that the, the the Prime Minister of, of Hungary and the French President should uh, you know, despite their uh, enmity, uh, should actually be dealing together on these big uh, international uh, issues. Uh, so that's that's something that is uh, that is that is quite troubling. Uh, the second issue, and here, I, I, in a way, I support what every absolutely everyone has been saying, is that from my perspective, the biggest challenge in Central and Eastern Europe in the next ten to twenty years will be uh, the modernization of the economy and basically the knock-on effects of uh, automation, rot robotization of, of work. Uh, and uh, basically, my question for all of you is: uh, What can the can these populist, uh, uh, you know, uh, alt uh, I don't know how to put it, alt authoritarian uh, regimes, uh, can they actually provide answers uh, to the looming uh, social issues that are uh, that, that are coming up? Uh, and this goes back to what Mr. Gita was saying about the fact that uh, well, it's the economy, stupid, which is actually. Uh, the, uh, the the main driver uh, of lots of uh, of discontent uh, in the region. The main one of the main drivers is, for example, the fact that you know convergence, uh, social economic convergence between Central and Eastern Europe uh, and Western Europe has not risen in the last few years and is not showing any signs uh, of of catching up. So I, I guess the question is, I mean, uh, do these do, do liberal forces that we represent here uh, in this room actually have the tools? Uh, to uh, to deal with this, or uh, are we uh, sort of condemned uh, to uh, look at uh, social programs like the one in in Poland uh, in in order to try and to basically uh, equalize uh, this uh, this this gap uh, without any sort of intervention from uh, from from outside? So a long open question. Thank you. Thank you for your question. And as I as I understood well, there is one question which is addressed especially you. So let's start with the, uh, with the others, and, and you, you can answer this very specific French question at the end. French to French, right? French to French. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd like to answer to the, uh, to the question concerning Hungary. Uh, actually, we had, a, we had a conference with a workshop at the Republican Institute where we invited uh, 
the newly elected mayors, also the very mayors, the mayor of the from the Momentum Party, who is now mayor of, uh, of the district, uh, of an important district in Budapest. And they've been talking a lot about how they want to uh, have, a, have, a, have a connection with citizens and they want to introduce new channels, uh, they are developing apps to outreach to, to citizens. So I think it's, it's an issue which is, which is there. So uh, somehow I think now the Hungarian opposition is at a stage where they, uh, they started to learn and they started to, uh, to, to believe in, uh, in, uh, in innovation in political innovation, and I think this is this is also a part of the political innovation. So I'm quite optimistic when it comes to this uh, have a have a bond with citizens. At least the politicians are ready to do that. I don't know if the citizens are, are ready to do that. But also, I think, uh, as a matter of fact, Viktor Orbán was the first uh, major politician in Hungary who talked about the robotization, the automatization, and how it could uh, uh, how it could affect uh, uh, the the labor market. Uh, so somehow, I think also the um, uh, opposition party, at least in, in Hungary, sometimes I think they they started to uh, to work on on uh, on the low level, which is very important. But I fear that maybe they could miss the uh, uh, the big picture uh, because maybe they are not ready to talk about major uh, social developments, uh, the, the transformation of the context. We already uh, discussed. So I think it's it's yeah, it's it's true. It's a very important thing. To uh, to consider these uh, these developments because if they don't they don't have answers uh, and at the end of the day Viktor Orban is the one who who is talking about these uh, the the major the major developments of the big transformation which he does from year to year um, but I think from this aspect what is important for at least for the opposition politicians uh, in Hungary to be uh, to be self conscious. That they have the they they, they are competent uh, to do that, and this is why actually I think it's it's important to have these these uh, success stories with what would be had at the at the municipal election. Yeah, talking about the Hungarian experience, uh, the new mayor so the mayor of Budapest, Gergely Karácsony, for example, wants to have a contract with uh, with Hungarian NGOs active uh, in Budapest and elsewhere, which was which is a totally new idea compared to the old behavior of the former mayor who did not want to talk to certainly those NGOs which, uh, according to the propaganda, are supported by uh, George Soros or any other NGOs at all. So already there was a big reception, everybody was invited, there will be a new framework how to cooperate with, with NGOs. Also, the, the citizens, sorry. sorry? Soros wouldn't, wouldn't communicate with the citizens. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's that's also true. But now Karajan certainly wants to open up, in general, the the city hall, which is uh, also in physical terms, he would probably open up a park instead of a closed building. Maybe there will be a coffee house and so on. So also symbolically, he wants to show that this is a different type of policy making than ever uh, before. Uh, also, I I think that. And I think, if I may react a little bit to what uh, Bertrand said, uh, actually I don't see so much contradiction because I think the opposition parties and NGOs already try to talk for those issues, what you or similar issues, but what you mentioned. We also in our publication uh, mentioned a lot of uh, policy areas where change is so important and public debate is so important. What I mean is that we need a sort of reconnection to the mainstream debates, what we have worldwide with uh, Greta Thunberg and with everybody involved, and not to proclaim by what's happening by the government that we have nothing to do with that. And uh, the opposition tries that, but it's very hard when you have an illiberal regime and everything is about Orban or non-Orban. That's what I. Uh, wanted to say that's all, otherwise we agree. And now the microphone is yours. Yeah, okay. And then uh, please try to yes, answer question. the French to French question as well. Well, it's quite simple. Uh, if uh, Stalin says that at uh, noon, 12 o'clock, it's day and not night, 
I wouldn't be uncomfortable to tell him, well, at least once you're right. This is a fact. When Mr. Orban says that we need in the European Union a common defense, I say to, I say to him, well, at last, at least on that point, you're right and completely right. And uh, when and what President Macron uh, said is very simple. At least, at last, on that point, Orban is right. 18 months ago, I was in Budapest for a book I wrote about Hungary. And uh, after three days, I discovered that he supported Orban, the common European defense. And I kept asking his supporter, but it's completely uh, contradictory with his opinion on European Union. Because if we have, with the member states, if we have a common defense policy, we have a common foreign diplomacy. And if we already have, and we have, uh, uh, economical, uh, economic and uh, political uh, policies in common, uh, uh, money in common, and now, the day after tomorrow, uh, a defense and a diplomacy in common, it will be, I'm sorry to say so, I'm sorry to say so, but it will be a kind of federation. It will be a kind of federation. And so how could you, uh, uh, can you explain this, such a deep contradiction in the views of your leader? And they were completely unable to answer this question. I asked this question to some of his closest advisors, and they were completely unable to answer the question. And so Macron is absolutely right to take it and to use it to, to show also the basic contradiction in Orban views. Now, Putin was the other question. Uh, when the Western democracies, United American and European, decided to conclude to sign with the Soviet Union at the Brezhnev time, at the beginning, at the late 70s beginning of the 80s, uh, to sign the Helsinki Agreement, did somebody in Washington, Paris, Berlin, Madrid, I don't know where, think that Mr. Brezhnev was a Democrat? Did somebody think that the Soviet Union was a democracy? Not at all, not at all. We signed an agreement with a dictatorship, with our common enemy to stabilize the borders uh, on the continent and to start, try to, to, to start uh, an economic cooperation. And there was the third, uh, what, what, what was it in English? The, the basket, basket. basket. The, 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 the third basket. And I do remember people telling, oh, 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 the third basket, how come? How a communist country, how the Soviet Union uh, could uh, apply uh, those uh, political rules and liberal rules. That's funny, that's ridiculous, that's shocking. Well, it was the main tool, as you know now, of the opponents. Because the dissidents in Soviet Union, in Poland, in Hungary, everywhere in the communist countries used the third basket to tell their, their communist leader, please apply the agreement you signed. And it was also 
the tool in the shipyard in Gdansk in 1980. The workers told the Communist Party, you sign in Geneva the agreement about the freedom of the trade unions and the free trade unions. We want to apply the international agreement signed by the Popular Republic of Poland. Let's try the same trick. Let's try the same trick. And they know that. Maybe Putin, because he knows that it is a trick, who won't, uh, won't agree at last to, to sign a new Helsinki agreement which would be different, of course, but nevertheless. But maybe he needs it exactly as Brezhnev, for very different reasons, needed the first Helsinki agreement 40 years ago. We'll see, but in any case, don't think even a second that Macron is so stupid to think that Putin is a democrat and that the Russian Federation is now a democracy. He's not completely stupid. Maybe a little bit. <laughs> you are free to think so, but completely no. And the last couple of minutes is for you, Katarzyna. Uh, yeah, we were in a different zone, so I'm gonna come back to the economy stupid thing. Uh, so I will actually put your words in the context about uh, more families uh, taking a swim, yeah, that you heard of. Yeah. So um, I think there is a one important factor that has to be also um, reminded. Apart from just redistributing money, it's also the moment when the money were distributed important. Because I think in Poland there was sort of the feeling that transformation was over already. And before, you know, like my parents or like generation of my parents, they were in a moment like we are get, we're keeping this tight because we are in this like poor revolution, revolutionary moment for transformation moment. So we all work for the better for our country. It was normal to save money. It was normal to, to go be harsh, you know, like with yourself to save, to, to, to contribute to the common development. But there become a point when you feel like how long? that has to be. And I think uh, what law and justice felt and what civic platform before and other parties did not feel that they, this moment passed. And there was a time to address this. I'm not saying to give money to people in whatever way, but to understand that the transformation is over in some sense, that we are not in the economical crisis because Poland actually did quite well during this uh, period. So. So I think the, the, like the economy and obviously always uh, like um, distributing money and giving money is uh, something that works. But I think there are special times when people understand they don't get them, like po uh, after the transformation. But when you see in the TV, in social media, and I'm sorry, this is very like maybe simplistic say, but that's how we human work. We open social media, we see all these people in Hawaii you know, and you're like, how, how come? Like, aren't we like all tied now? No, we can actually, can go to Hawaii and then some very like, uh, you know, not too thought through uh, comments of some politicians of liberals, like how, how can you really afford to live, you know, in this country in Warsaw for 9,000, like whatever is what, and people are like, oh, actually I'm living for two, you know, like, so I think there was this moment, this momentum when the redistribution had a special context and dignity, that is a very important word, and the control, that's another important word. There were researches done by, um, uh, there were quality interviews done to, to that whole Poland by one of the, Mr. Gdula, maybe you heard of him, he's now in the leftist party, advisor. So actually what came up is that people who were voting for uh, law and justice, they were also little careful with redistributing money. You may not think about this, but they were not like, oh, let's give all this money to all these people. No, no, people want control. They want to know what's going to happen and to what people become, but they want to control. They want to see that the government is understanding there is the time to make this redistribution. 
the government sees and acknowledge, or anyone who governs, that there is a differences between the, uh, the payment gaps or the quality of life. So I think the, the, this context of the end of the transformation uh, and the redistribution was very important. And now, I don't know how opposition's going to admit that, because honestly, I mean, obviously, then we'll hear like, oh, we're not going to take it back. If we are in the power, we understand this. But obviously, they do speak from the second place. They speak from the reactive place. So like everybody, of course you want, because yeah, you have no choice, you're gonna lose. But when was your time to think about this, to, to understand, to feel us? You were busy with yourself. I mean, obviously this is a bit of biased narrative, but uh, that's how it was. So yeah, and speaking of populism, um, that's maybe a little bit of the definition of it, because obviously populists are right, not only sometimes, but very often they are right. But the mechanism they are applying towards very well-defined needs in the society are far more than what they promise to the society and they are very abusive. So that's how I, not being any like scientist, would call populism. It's understanding what's lacking, but then abusing the needs of people towards more gains than I said. So I don't know what would answer your question because actually I wanted to say something else, but I hope, uh, I hope that a little bit gave the context to, to the redistribution. I have no answer for this. In two sentences, the first question. And the, the answer is quite simple. To build or rebuild, I don't care, build or rebuild political parties answering the question asked by the people. So you will build a new political party in uh, your way, and uh, maybe it's the good way, by the way, I don't know. Uh, some other will build a new political party to uh, fight, uh, I mean political fight, and strike, and social movements, and I don't know why. We'll see, but in any case, to build or rebuild relevant political parties and trade unions. Thank you. Unfortunately, now we have to finish this uh, panel discussion because uh, we are running out of time. Uh, but uh, obviously, there will be a little time here uh, later to to continue if uh, if you can stay here. So thank you for. Uh, for accepting our invitation and uh, and being with us uh, this afternoon, and now uh, the floor is uh, for the regional director of the Norman Foundation uh, for concluding remarks. Uh, thank you for being together with us, and uh, thank you for coming. Uh, yes, in the program it says. Uh, uh, Closing remarks. Um, I think after such a distinguished uh, panel with uh, such a fight of uh, arguments uh, going back and forth, there are no uh, words left uh, to, to put about that. We have a German saying which uh, goes like this: um, "Es gibt nichts Gutes außer man tut it," which is almost uh, "There is no good until you do it." And uh, I think that is uh, what, what can summarize um, all that we have heard of you, that you simply need people uh, to stand up, uh, to do and to go into politics, to raise money, to raise other people, to raise votes, and uh, to do what uh, should be done in politics, uh, to look for majorities. And I think there will come a day, sooner or later, uh, like it has always been, in, um, in, in countries that people are fed up with uh, their leaders and search for something else. Nobody knows when that will be the case. If it's next year, if it's uh, in two years, and uh, what the reason for that uh, will be, if it's uh, uh, hard e economics or simply a little scandal, um, you never know. But uh, for us, as a um, political foundation, uh, I can say we feel very proud uh, to give the floor to people like you, 
just to seriously discuss uh, uh, arguments, and uh, that is what uh, makes our life uh, worth living. And so happy to have you here, happy to have to share uh, more ideas now uh, and with a little, little light uh, dinner. So thanks again, and uh, looking forward to, to future discussions. Thank you. Thank you.